uh, we now must move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Mr. Neil Somerville. Mr. Somerville. Yes, <laughs> now. Question number one. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, the consultation on the rationalisation of the court estate closed on the 18th of May this year. The responses to the consultation have been analysed and advice will be submitted to me later this month. I will wish to carefully consider the responses and the recommendations before reaching any conclusions. And I call Mr Somerville for a supplement. <clears throat> Thank you Mr Speaker. I am sure you already know what the supplementary is. Uh, is the Minister aware of the serious concerns about the prospect of Inniskill and Courthouse closing? and the impact this will have in terms of access, uh, accessing justice to leading to delays right across Fermanagh and South Tyrone? Well, Mr Speaker, I am certainly aware of concerns by a small number of people around a number of courthouses across Northern Ireland. But the reality is access to justice is not an issue of having a courthouse in every town. It's an issue of ensuring that we have proper courthouses fit for purpose with modern facilities. And in the context of the financial circumstances we live in, the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunal Service, like other agencies, has to deliver significant savings in the coming years. That cannot be done maintaining 20 courthouses for a population of 1.8 million people, and rationalisation is required. The important thing is to ensure that courthouses meet the needs of people when they get there, rather than there is an inadequate facility sitting in every town and every village. I call Mr Sean Lynch. Would the Minister agree that his views on the closures don't, aren't shared by the Chief uh, Justice? And would he agree that the current proposals will undermine access and quality of justice? Good. Well, Mr Speaker, to take the second point first, no, I certainly don't agree that the proposals will undermine access to justice. Justice may be slightly further away, but if it's in a better building with better facilities, for example, to segregate uh, vulnerable victims and witnesses from the alleged perpetrators of crimes, I believe that that would be a bonus for access to justice. Um, I also, having just heard the Lord Chief Justice give his annual speech for the start of the legal year, noted that he acknowledged that whilst he had expressed his concerns, there are significant issues around finances which need to be addressed. And for example, I noticed the good work which has been done by the presiding district judge, which is already uh, resulting in a reduction in the number of court sitting days required. All the more reason why we should be concentrating those court sittings in modern fit-for-purpose courthouses. Commissioner Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for his uh, answers. I don't know where he gets the idea that there's only a small number of people uh, concerned about this issue. I attended the public meeting in Armagh Courthouse, and all of the political parties on the then Council were against the closure of Armagh Courthouse. And does the Minister not agree with me that the closure of Armagh Courthouse will indeed uh, downgrade Armagh's status as a city and also deny people access to justice locally? And the legal profession themselves uh, believe that it will lead to backlogging of cases in the Craigavon and Newry Courthouses. Well, again, Mr. Speaker, the evidence from the proposals that were put forward was that adequate court sittings can be provided in the courthouses which were proposed to be retained in that consultation document to meet the needs of court sittings which would normally occur in those proposed for closure. So I don't believe that that would impinge on access to justice. I'm well aware of how local councillors tend to view facilities in their town or city, but that is not the basis on which we can take a rational decision on how to fund the operation of the courts and tribunal service in the years ahead. And it is not the function of the Department of Justice to maintain historic buildings, which some have suggested. It is the function of the Department of Justice to provide a fit-for-purpose modern justice system for the people of Northern Ireland. And that is what we are seeking to do within the financial constraints that, that we are put under. Thank you. And before we move on, could I just inform the members that question nine has been withdrawn within the appropriate time frame? And I call Mr. John Dallet. Question number two, Mr. Speaker. Disclosure requires a balance to be struck between the rights of the individual 
and the need to protect vulnerable people. Access NI is required by statute to disclose information in relation to informed warnings, cautions and diversionary youth conferences in standard and enhanced checks. These non-court disposals are considered to form part of an individual's criminal record. To ensure a proportionate approach before disclosure, such dispo disclosures may be filtered, that is, removed from the certificate if they are considered to be old or for offences that are considered minor. Informed warnings are filtered after one year, youth cautions and diversionary youth conferences are filtered after two years, and adult cautions are filtered after six years. Disposals are not filtered for violent, sexual or drug offences. The Justice Act of 2015 makes provision for anyone who considers that a non-court disposal should be removed from their certificate to appeal to an independent person. That independent person can require the Department to remove such non-court disposals from a certificate if he considers that they are not relevant or ought not to have been disclosed. I propose to commence these provisions early next year. Well, Mr. Dallet, for a supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I welcome the response from the uh, Minister so far. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that given the serious problems this has caused, not just for new applicants but indeed for people in existing jobs, will he undertake uh, to monitor and review that situation on an ongoing basis because people who got warnings about very, very minor infringements of the law find themselves not just in a very embarrassing position but sometimes in a position where their jobs may be lost. Well, I'm certainly happy to give the assurance to Mr. Dallet that this is an issue which, like many other issues across justice, is kept under review. There are certainly issues as to how we define minor convictions. I know there have been concerns expressed where somebody has two or three minor convictions which have a cumulative effect, which would not be the case if it was a single one. But there is a real issue about how we balance the rights of the individual to live a life as normally as possible in the future and ensuring that we protect vulnerable members of the public. I'm quite happy to keep it under review, but it will not be easy to take the, the decision one way or the other in every case. Thank you. And I call Mr. Alec Maskey. I get uh, question number three. three. I'm discussing with the Lord Chief Justice a number of measures to improve the performance of the coroner's service including the appointment of investigating officers and the Lord Chief Justice assuming the presidency of the coroner's courts. As the member will recognise, progress in dealing with the past, including the legacy inquest process, can only be made in the context of the full implementation of the Stormont House Agreement and provision of the associated funding. The Minister for that reply. Could I ask the Minister, does he agree that the recent comments from the uh, coroner, John Laggy, points out that the the current system is uh, having a very negative impact on public confidence and that remedial action will be required to restore that confidence? Well, Mr Speaker, it's not just a matter of remedial action being required. Remedial action is being taken, including, for example, the appointment of an additional county court judge to enable judges to take over some of the more complex uh, issues of uh, coronial investigation, in particular the legacy inquests. Uh, so that work is being done. And certainly, as we look to the retirement of the current senior coroner, the assumption of the presidency by the Lord Chief Justice will, I believe, uh, provide leadership for the coroner's service, which will help us move forward. But clearly, there are a number of issues, including illness of coroners, which have created difficulties in the past. I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank the Minister for his uh, answers thus far. Can I ask him, though, uh, imagine for a second that the Stormont House Agreement is implemented and the funds are available? Is he confident that we can? Uh, fill the gaps in terms of personnel, in terms of recruitment, to ensure that we meet all the needs of uh, the legacy issues? Well, of course, uh, Mr Eastwood raises quite rightly the issue of appropriate personnel. I mean, the, the question was originally around investigating officers. There are then the issues around, around the coroners or judges acting as coroners. There are very significant resource implications, and that does require a provision of the finance to do it. And there are, of course, other rules which are provided for under the Storm and House Agreement, which may require people with similar skill sets working in the HIU, for example. So I cannot give any guarantee. What I can give the guarantee is that the DOJ will do all it can to ensure that we get the process underway. But there are issues of the very significant number of legacy inquests currently listed and the work which needs to be done by the judiciary to ensure that those are put into order and proceeded with as fast as possible. 
I call Mr. Michael Majimsi. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister, in view of the fact that this matter is a key part of the Stormont House Agreement, and I welcome his comments about the, the, the full implementation of the agreement, uh, will he confirm to the House that he is not currently considering a partial implementation of the Stormont House Agreement, but in fact he's working towards the full implementation? Thank you. I appreciate Mr. McJimsey's question, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure that the Minister of Justice can say that he's working towards a full implementation, and it's not the role of the Alliance Party leader to argue at this particular rostrum that he is arguing for the full implementation. Uh, the Minister of Justice is seeking to ensure that the DOJ fulfills its responsibilities, principally around the HIU and legacy inquests, and ensures that we play our part in getting a joined up system so that the Stormont House Agreement can be put into place as fast as possible. Thank you. And Ms. Megan Ferrin is not in her place. So I call Mr. Robin Swan. Question number five, Mr. Speaker. Any assault in prison, whether it is on a prison officer or a prisoner, is unacceptable. There have been a total of 282 assaults on prison officers on duty in prison establishments in the four financial years beginning in 2011. From an operational perspective, the Northern Ireland Prison Service has taken forward detailed analysis in respect of assaults on staff and found that the greatest contributing factor is crowding. A significant number of prisoners were moved from crowded residential areas in 2014 to address this issue. The use of accommodation is kept under regular review and the prison population is dynamically managed in this respect. Additionally, the Prison Service has recently commissioned a pilot to evaluate the effectiveness of body-warm cameras for prison staff to prevent violence and assist in the management of disruptive prisoners. Initial results at McGabry suggest a significant deterrent effect. NIPS has improved its mechanisms for recording assaults, analysing the factors involved, and maintains a high level of vigilance in respect to prison violence. It also engages constructively with the Prison Officers Association on a regular basis to discuss staff safety. And I call Mr. Robin Swan for a supplement. Thank the Speaker. And to be honest with you, Minister, I'm shocked at those figures because that's an average over that four year period of one prison officer being injured per week while on duty. If the core issue is crowding, can I ask the Minister what he's actually doing to ensure that manning levels are sufficient to ensure that the safety of officers and what he's doing to address this low staff morale within the prison service at this minute in time? Well, Mr. Swan talks about low staff morale. There is no doubt that there are particular issues which have resulted, for example, um, in significant sickness levels in Magabry in particular, much less so in Hyde Bank and McGilligan, and that may be attributed to low morale. That's why uh, issues of addressing at leadership level within Magabry, work is being done to deal with issues like sickness levels and to ensure that there are better staff ratios. But the key issue was, as I said in my principal answer, the issue of crowding. That appeared to be the principal reason why. That's why, with the opening of an additional block, the movement of people out of some of the crowded old square houses, it has produced a better atmosphere and less difficulty. But the prison service will continue to have to manage within the limited budget it has to ensure that staffing ratios are at the best possible level consistent with living within that budget. I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Um, Minister, are you satisfied that they, um, they are sufficient resources and that prisoners are out of their cells uh, engaging in meaningful um, activity um, during the day rather than a regime of lockdown resulting in tensions? Where Margaret? Well, I would never be satisfied that we have all the resources that could be profitably used within the prison service. No. Am I satisfied that we have seen significant progress in good work being done by the prison service? Yes. I think any members, and some have had the opportunity to visit Hyde Bank Wood recently, will have seen a very significant progress in terms of the regime being offered to both the young men and the women in Hyde Bank Wood. Good work is also being done in McGilligan. Progress has been slower in McGabry. That is the reality. But all of that is predicated on living within the budget, living with the staffing numbers we have, and seeking the best form of management. When I became minister, for example, there was no free movement, even of the lowest category prisoners within McGabry. That sort of change has freed things up, has created a better atmosphere, has produced better use of staff. So progress has been made, but undoubtedly there is still a lot to do, particularly at McGabry. Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Speaker, I think I would be concerned at the, the level of assaults, but um, has the redefinition of recording assaults been a factor in inflating the number of reported assaults, Minister? 
I think Mr Rogers raises an entirely valid point, although it may not be so much a matter of your redefinition as slightly more accurate recording. Um, and we should be aware that whilst assaults are serious if there is an intent behind them in every case, some of them are not what would be described as serious assaults. So you know, we should not suggest that there is a very significant number of major incidents, but undoubtedly there have been a small number of serious incidents and a rather larger number of minor incidents. The important issue is to ensure that we provide the necessary support to staff. We deal with issues like crowding to address some of those problems of frustration which have led to assaults, and we get an overall picture where we make improvements in the current situation. That's why I've emphasised that there have been significant improvements in some cases, but sadly not everywhere. Thank you. And I call Mr Alvin McGuinness. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Number six. Mr Speaker, let me first recognise that the family of Kevin McGuigan are suffering a grievous loss, as are the family of Jared Davison. The way in which these men were brutally murdered has shocked the entire community. These were cowardly and despicable acts, and those who committed them or assisted should face justice. There can never be any justification for murder. I was, of course, briefed by the Chief Constable in general terms. We need to keep in mind that there is a live investigation ongoing, and the detail of the investigation is an operational matter for the Chief Constable. My officials and I are also in regular contact with the Secretary of State and her officials. I call Mr McGuinness for a supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and um, could I thank the Minister for his answers, uh, uh, for, for his answer, and agree with him and share with him uh, condemnation of the murder and uh, the feeling of regard for both uh, Mr Davison and uh, Mr McGuigan's families. But the, there was an assessment made by the Chief Constable which was made public. That was the, that there was the provisional IRA existed and that members of Action Against Drugs and members of the provisional IRA were involved in the carrying out of this murder. What weight and what authority would you place on that assessment? Well, I think Mr McGuinness has put his finger on exactly the issue. Uh, we have all seen the comments made by the Chief Constable and the assessment that he has made. Uh, it is clear from what he is saying that he does not believe that there was a sanctioned murder of Mr McGuigan, but it is also clear from the statement he made that he believed members of the provisional IRA and other criminals, including dissident Republicans, were involved in that murder. That is something which I believe requires the attention of all of us to ensure that we provide a political solution which moves away from these kind of uh, troubles leading to death and destruction and loss on our streets. I also believe we need to ensure that we create the atmosphere in which an organisation which is said to not be active but clearly still has members who have engaged in criminal activity should fade away entirely in line with what we wish to see, particularly those of us who supported the Good Friday Agreement and its concept of moving to a different society. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Is the Minister satisfied that the PSNI have the necessary resources to carry out a thorough and proper investigation into the murder of Kevin McGuigan? Well, the issue is for the Chief Constable to deploy the resources he has. Members are well aware of the fact that the police service has reduced resources this year compared to last year, but how those resources are used against the different demands on the police service are operational issues for the Chief Constable. He has not suggested to me that that particular murder requires him to have any more resources than were already planned for, but clearly that is the kind of issue which can be kept under review. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given uh, the remarks of the, uh, the Justice Minister, can he assure the House that he is not going to recommend uh, that the provisional IRA is removed from the list of prescribed organisations and that he holds evidence to justify them remaining on the prescribed list of illegal organisations? Well, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Nesbitt doesn't seem to understand the difference in role between the Secretary of State for National Security Matters and the Minister of Justice in the devolved arena. 
Thank you. And I call Mr. Daphne Mackay. Case number is shot. Question number seven. Under the Stormont House Agreement, Mr. Speaker, my department is responsible for the establishment of a new historical investigations unit and improving the legacy inquest function. The HIU will be an independent body to take forward investigations into outstanding troubles related deaths. My officials have been engaging with stakeholders and victims groups throughout this process. In order to advise a wider group of stakeholders on the DOJ proposals, the Legacy Unit held three engagement wor workshops in early August to set out the policy position of the DOJ in relation to these initiatives and allow stakeholders to raise any queries. Whilst the DOJ will not be holding any further workshops, the Legacy Unit continues to engage with stakeholders on an ongoing bilateral basis as the legislation to introduce these elements of the Stormont House Agreement is finalised. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask the Minister if he is satisfied that the Department's stakeholder list is comprehensive? Uh, and can I ask, is there provision for bona fide groups to be added to that list? Well, my understanding in terms of those who were invited to meetings was that there was an invitation to those who uh, represented victims to involve other victims groups in attending those. Certainly, I attended to welcome uh, members to one of the three uh, workshops which was held in the DOJ, and there was a very substantial attendance at that. Uh, but it wasn't intended to be a full-scale consultation process because the five parties meeting in the Stormont House Implementation Group had not agreed to a document being issued for consultation. Uh, that's why engagement has been largely on a bilateral basis as well as those three particular workshops. And that continues. And if there are groups which have not yet had the opportunity to engage with my officials, I would invite them to write in and arrange such consultation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm mindful that the uh, Secretary of State announced over the weekend that uh, the risk government would unilaterally legislate on welfare. And have in regard to the reported comments of one of your own officials in the Belfast Telegraph over the summer, has London given any indication to you uh, that the London government might be minded to unilaterally legislate in respect of the legacy mechanisms in the case, including the HIU? Uh, in the event that political progress is not made? Well, I appreciate the point Mr Adwin is making. Um, no indication has been given to me of a unilateral intention to legislate. But, of course, the proposals in the Stormont House Agreement require legislation this autumn in Westminster. The important thing, I believe, is to see the five parties engaging together to ensure that we put a collective view to the Westminster Government as to how that legislation should be carried. Unfortunately, uh, the decisions which have been taken so far in the implementation group have not yet resulted in a firm agreed proposal going to the Westminster Government. That is where I believe it is important that we can continue to engage in that format to ensure that there are agreed proposals put forward. Thank you. Um, I call Mr Jim Allister. Question eight. Mr Speaker, I am already on record as saying that I was aware of the IMC's final report in 2011, which stated that the provisional IRA was committed to peaceful means and had moved away from paramilitarism, but that some members and former members were active in non-terrorist types of crime. Mr Allister, for supplement. The Minister purports to be the Minister of Justice. In that role, he doubtless receives briefings. Uh, is he suggesting to this House that he had no knowledge that the IRA was still likely to be involved in killing, such as in the McGuigan case? Or was he just turning a deaf ear to that? And can he tell us, are there any members of the provisional IRA on the executive on which he sits? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm afraid Mr. Allister is falling into the same trap as Mr. Nesbitt fell into a few minutes ago. The Minister of Justice does not have responsibility for national security matters. The Minister of Justice, of course, receives general briefing from the police service, not all of which is given on a basis other than in ministerial confidence. But the Minister of Justice does not have access to the national security information on which the Secretary of State might have responsibilities to make judgments in the future. That is an entirely different issue. I am really surprised that neither of the gentlemen understand the current legal position. And I call Mr Mike Nesbitt. Question 10. 
Mr Speaker, my assessment as Justice Minister is naturally based on the views of the Chief Constable. He is on record as saying that the police do not see the provisional IRA as being involved in terrorism. They are not involved in paramilitary activity in the sense that they were during the period of the conflict. The Chief Constable has also indicated that he does not have information at the moment to suggest that the murder of Kevin McGuigan was sanctioned or directed at a senior level. I believe that we need to be guided by the Chief Constable's view based on the evidence and intelligence available to him. That, of course, does not make what happened in any way acceptable. Murder is not acceptable in any circumstances. Mr Nesbitt, for supplementary. Given the Minister is the Minister for Justice, uh, given he has a relationship with the Police Service of Northern Ireland, given the Police Service of Northern Ireland spends significant budget and devotes significant resource uh, to patrolling terrorism, can the Minister explain why he keeps ducking the question? Mr Speaker, I could understand it if some members of this House, dare I say it, members with a nationalist background who don't approve of Northern Ireland being part of the United Kingdom, raised the kind of question which has just been raised by Mr Nesbitt and Mr Alistair. But it really is slightly bizarre that unionists don't understand the concept of the national security of the United Kingdom being the responsibility, funnily enough, of the government of the United Kingdom. They don't understand the basis on which justice was evolved in 2010. They don't understand the role of the minister not appearing in operational issues. And they don't understand the entire way in which the system functions. And I really think that if Mr Nesbitt was going to start talking about people ducking their responsibilities, he really ought to look at his actions and those of Danny Kennedy. Order, 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 I call, order, I call Mr Jim Mallister. The Minister repeated to us the assertion of the Chief Constable, but could I ask him to explain to the House, how can a member of a prescribed organisation be involved in murder and that not be an act of terrorism. Could he explain that conundrum, please? Well, just as I said, I don't deal in operational matters which are responsible to the Chief Constable, nor is it my role, Mr Speaker, to explain what the Chief Constable means when he makes statements. But it does seem to me that he made a fairly clear distinction when he said the provisional IRA is not involved in paramilitary activity in the sense that they were during the period of the conflict. That doesn't make murder acceptable. That doesn't make what has been happening in Belfast, the murders of two men in recent months, acceptable in any way. And I condemn those murders utterly. And I have no hesitation in the case of any criminal activity on asking anyone who has information to assist the police in catching the perpetrators so the justice system can play its proper role. But to suggest that it's my role to explain the, the words of the Chief Constable what his responsibility is, it's just the same as expecting me to explain the role of the Secretary of State. Those who want to know what either the Secretary of State or the Chief Constable should be doing in current circumstances really ought to contact the Secretary of State or the Chief Constable and not ask somebody who has a very specific role in the devolved sphere not in connection with national security, not in connection with operational matters, but the job of doing policy work and legislation work in this assembly, of providing the finances and leaving other people to carry out their responsibilities, just as I don't expect them to carry out mine. Thank you. And uh, we've exhausted the list of questions, Minister, so we'll move straight on to topical questions. And I call Mr John Dallas. Uh, Mr Speaker, as the existence of paramilitaries is very topical in this House uh, today, can I ask the Minister, is he aware that Loyalist paramilitaries in North Antrim and East Derry have been doing their very best to run parallel systems of justice uh, there? And can he tell the House, has he been screaming from the rooftops about that? Has he raised it at meetings of the executive? And finally, would he accept that this assembly cannot tolerate paramilitaries of any kind, and certainly the continuing existence of some for the last 15 years is an absolute disgrace? Well, I sympathise entirely with the point that Mr. Tallis is putting forward. 
I have not been screaming from the rooftops about unionist paramilitaries. I have not raised the issue at the executive, but I certainly have regular and frequent discussions with the Chief Constable, with the Secretary of State and with others who have particular responsibility, whether dealing with organised crime or those issues which, frankly, uh, do cross over between the criminal activities and the national security activities, because that includes both those who claim to be unionists and those who claim to be republicans. And I certainly discuss those frequently. And in terms of the resource issues that, where I have responsibility for the police, I'm determined to see that adequate resources are given to the police and other aspects of the justice system. But Mr. Dalit is absolutely right. There are more than one uh, paramilitary group who have created difficulties uh, in Northern Ireland generally over the years, and there certainly appears to be a level of activity by those who would claim to be unionists of some shape or form, whose activities are just as much criminal and terrorist as some of those who claim Republican motivations. Mr. Dalit for supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer, which I regard as positive and very timely uh, at this moment of crisis in this Assembly. Would the Minister agree with me that whatever outcomes there are from the talks, that for the first time this Assembly must be allowed to move forward as one people, completely free of any paramilitary uh, influence of any kind? And indeed, is it opportune now for some people in the unionist uh, parties to reflect on their continuing association with the so-called political advisers of loyalist paramilitaries? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't just think this assembly needs to be able to move forward. I think this society needs to be able to move forward from those who would seek to subvert the rule of law, those who claim political motivations to run drug empires, and those who can continue to behave in a way which is utterly unacceptable. And I must say, I do agree with uh, the final point he made about the association between some who are democratically elected politicians in this place and the association they have with some of those who maintain links to criminal and paramilitary groups, particularly over issues like the so-called Twiddell camp. I think it really is time that those who point the finger about the behaviour of paramilitaries on one side need to look at the people with whom they at times consort. Thank you. And I call Mr Jerry Kelly. Uh, John Kelly. And the Minister will be aware that uh, John Lackey, the coroner, is retiring, and I understand that two others are sick. Um, could you let the Assembly know what the plan is and the time frame involved in uh, replacing the coroner and if the others are going to be replaced on a temporary, uh, temporary or permanent basis? Well, as Mr Kelly says, uh, the senior coroner is due to retire shortly. I have been discussing with the Lord Chief Justice the issue that we provided for in the last Justice Act of him assuming presidency of the coroner's courts, and I hope that that will happen shortly. He has also, as I have said previously, um, appointed an additional county court judge to lead on some of the more complex inquests, particularly legacy inquests. Um, he also has the power, which I have uh, recently raised with him, to appoint temporary coroners <coughs> who would be able to carry some of the additional work, um, given that, as he has highlighted, there is an issue of illness among some of the coroners, as well as the pending retirement. Uh, the Minister will also be aware that there are many families waiting on the inquest uh, coming through, so this is a, a matter of urgency. I, I wasn't quite sure of the time frame that uh, he, if he did talk about it during his answer there. Uh, this is an urgent issue, I mean, for all of us, but certainly for those families. Uh, so he can give some idea of the time frame involved. Um. I understand the senior coroner is due to retire at the end of October, and the expectation was that the, uh, the Lord Chief Justice would assume presidency then from the beginning of November. He rightly raises the issue um, of concerns amongst a number of families about the delay that there had been in inquests. It is unfortunate that in a number of cases, uh, inquests have been listed without resources being provided. Um, <coughs> either in terms of investigative function before it or for the precise time for the coroner's courts to be held. And that is the, the sort of management issue which I hope will be addressed shortly by the Lord Chief Justice. And I also trust that we will see a positive outcome 
to the discussions over the next few weeks, which will see the additional resources to fund the legacy inquest properly alongside the work of the HIU, because that will be essential to provide comfort to those uh, individuals and families who have been waiting many years to see results. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Fran McCann. Good morning, I got and uh, the Minister knows I have recently uh, written to him about the withdrawal of funding or, uh, to an agro in relation to the transport of prisoners' families to and fro uh, prison. Could the Minister give us an update on this? Um, I'm allowed a slight smile, Mr. Speaker. I did have rather suspicion of what Mr. McCann might be asking about. Um, he referred to the withdrawal of funding. To, to be fair, it is not the withdrawal of funding, it is the reduction of funding. And detailed work was done over the summer looking at the usage of the Niagara buses um, travelling to the prisons and to see what the level of need was, what an appropriate charge was. At this stage, it is likely that we will be able to continue to maintain grant aid to support Niagara running buses on the longer runs, effectively Belfast, McGilligan and from the Derry area to mm -hmm. McGabry. But some of the shorter runs uh, are not frankly viable in terms of the amount of use which is made of them. There are issues which are being looked at in order to ensure the prison service uh, funds the meeting of public transport services to take people to the prisons rather than running the complete distance and a modest increase in the charges levied, I hope will be that it is possible to maintain the services relatively unaffected, though not on as many days. Mr McCann for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for his response, uh, but I have recently been speaking to uh, some relatives of prisoners uh, in, the, in the Greater Belfast area who are concerned uh, that the reduction of funding, as the Minister said, uh, will have a, a, an impact on their ability to visit uh, the prison to be able to get to it, to, to maintain relationships uh, with uh, their loved one who may be in prison, uh, but also to maintain the relationship uh, with their children. And, uh, my understanding again is that uh, there has been a considerable uh, cut in the amount of hours uh, that this service will be available to the, those families. Well, I'm not sure the considerable is, is fair, though I accept that for those who have been using it on particular days, it will have an effect. But, I mean, for example, you know, we're looking at the Derry to McGabry service still running two days a week rather than three. Now, that may mean that some people need to vary the times in which they would have been going, but I think it's not unreasonable you know, to accept that, faced with all the other cuts that are happening, still providing that service on two days a week is a reasonable effort. I certainly think we need to look also, as I highlighted, about the better use of public transport and meeting public transport rather than the Niagara bus running the whole way. But certainly there, there were cases where occupancy was below 40 per cent on the buses that were there, and it seems to me in the, those kind of circumstances it's not unreasonable to reduce the number of days per week and have the buses fuller when they're actually running. Thank you. And Mr Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, could I ask for an update on any discussions that have taken place between your department and the, and the legal profession with respect to the profession of legal aid? Um, Mr Speaker, I think if I went over the two minutes, you'd probably tell me off on that. Um, shall we say, over the summer, there have been very significant discussions around the issue of legal aid rates. Um, those discussions are continuing, and there's a, a significant amount of work being done around that. Uh, what is absolutely clear is that we have to live within the budget we have, and that the, currently the expenditure on legal aid uh, is not uh, credible to maintain into the future. But there have been detailed discussions following a period in which there was a reluctance on the part of uh, both the Law Society and the Bar to engage. There have been some positive and useful discussions. Um, recommendations are being made, and of course members will be aware uh, that there is a judicial review currently pending against the Department, jointly by the Law Society and the Bar Council. I hope it will be possible to avert that uh, on the basis of proposals which are currently being put, and I believe the Justice Committee is likely to see some of those proposals this week. Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Could I, could I welcome that from the Minister? Uh, and you know, I, I know everybody has to live within their budgets, but particularly with the concerns expressed by many, including the President of the Law Society, the reduction of legal aid funds as an attack on access to justice for the most vulnerable. How does he hope to further address that? 
Well, there are, there are two elements in a sense. One is the immediate issue as to how we live uh, with current arrangements, and the second is the wider issue where I will shortly be seeing the report of the second stage of the Access to Justice Review, which will enable us to look um, at issues of scope and whether there are different ways of meeting needs. I certainly believe that there are some areas where it is possible to have um, decisions taken at lower tier courts which would therefore reduce the cost but still provide a service. There may be some issues where mediation is suitable rather than going into an adversarial court system which will provide benefits there. And I think we need to also look at issues like insurance. All of those are issues which are being considered. But the key issue at this point is to find a way of living within the budget whilst doing the best we can to maintain that as much as possible is kept within scope but that is not going to be the case if there are alternatives which are viable and which are suitable for the future. Thank you. And I call Mr Cahill O'Hoshi. Well, uh, Can I ask the Minister that uh, recently I have visited the new wastewater treatment plant at Point Road in McGilligan, a facility that many of us fought long and hard for, uh, and which now con uh, considerably treats uh, much of the waste coming from the prison. Is the Minister confident that the capacity will be there for that treatment, uh, particularly in high season when the uh, population there swells by many, many thousand? Mr Speaker, I'm aware we don't have a Minister for Regional Development at the moment, but, but I'm really not sure that I'm in a position to answer a question about the capacity of a wastewater treatment work. Um, but if you know, I mean, Mr Horshin has, has outlined specific uh, concerns, um, I'm quite happy to say that I will see if I can find a Minister for Regional Development to engage with in the coming weeks, I will so engage with him. And a supplementary, if you can. We've got to get a supplementary out of that one. Thank you, uh, Concordia. Uh, Concordia. Uh, during the time, and it has, the prison has been in operation for, for some 40 odd years um, with its own internal system. I'm wondering, as Minister, aware of any environmental damage, given that that is a very, very sensitive uh, environmental area, it has a number of designations on it, or is he aware of any environmental damage that has been ca uh, caused uh, during that period when the prison was doing its own uh, wastewater treatment? And the answer to that, Mr Speaker, is I am not aware of any damage that has been done. Indeed, the prison service has an, an interesting environmental record, for example, in, in providing for ground nesting birds around McGabry that we, that we can claim some degree of credit for. But I certainly take the point he's making, and I will investigate it and come back to him. Thank you. And I call Mr Dahi McKay. Can, uh, can I ask the Minister, can I give us an assessment uh, of the number of sectarian hate crimes uh, that were reported and acted on? Uh, at bonfires over the summer period? Uh, the simple answer is not at the present time, Mr Speaker, but certainly I would share the concern which I suspect Mr Mackay is about to express about the way in which hate crimes were carried out, um, or if he wants to put it very personally, putting a Sinn Féin election poster on a loyalist bonfire is no more acceptable than putting an Alliance Party poster on a bonfire. There are real issues where what is claimed as cultural expression and it's not just by those who burned bonfires on the 11th of July, but there are real issues where cultural expression tips over into sectarian hatred. And I certainly believe that there is a real need to address hatred, whatever kind it, come, it is, whatever day of the year it occurs, and wherever it happens. And the Commissioner for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? Uh, can I ask him, in terms of planning for next year, I mean, these displays are totally uh, unacceptable, no matter what the bonfire is, or what loca location it is, uh, or what the background of the bonfire is. Uh, but will he ensure that steps are taken to ensure that there is a significant reduction in these displays for next year, given the, the restrictions that he does operate under? Uh, will he ensure that a strong message goes to the police that they need to take a tougher line with these bonfires? Well, again. Um Mr Mackay is almost in the same problem as Mr Alistair and Mr Nesbitt in, you know, in inviting me to interfere too much operationally. Um, it is, however, reasonable to say I have expressed a view to the police of my concerns about the way in which the management of those bonfires happened, but not in the sense of giving a direction, which was what he was almost hinting at there. But there are fundamental issues about the way this society functions, about the need to be rather more respectful 
and some issues that happen about the need to ensure the cultural expression is a positive cultural expression by those who wish to engage in certain activities and not a negative sign of hatred. And sadly, we've seen too much of that. One of the pleasant things of the last few days has been people concerned about the issue of refugees arriving in the European Union and talking about what Northern Ireland could do to help them. I hope that we, if that is the case, and a number come, we don't see the kind of hate crime that we saw in different parts of Belfast on racial grounds, just the same as I would wish to see an end to hate crime on sectarian grounds or homophobic grounds or grounds against people with disabilities. All of those are issues which are unacceptable and all of those need the support of society generally to fight as well as we require the police to carry out their duties under the law. And that is time up. And thank you, Minister. Uh, you ended up taking questions. A few extra minutes as well, but questions on a number of other briefs. But uh, thank you very much.